Welcome to Gamecock Pod Live. For the next three to four years, I'll be committed to the University of South Carolina. This is Rodgers again to the 25, 20, 15, 10. Rodgers scores! Oh, Sending shockwaves through the SEC. Right 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 That's a win! Unbelievable! Oh, I don't believe it! And now, live from Studio 54 of the Gamecock Pod Studios, here's the cockfather himself, Keith Alsep. All right, everybody, welcome in to Gamecock Pod Live for March the 22nd, episode number 1183 of Gamecock Pod Daily and Gamecock Pod Live. I am your host, Keith Alsep. We've got a jam-packed show for you today. We're back and better than ever. We took off last week for spring break. But in just a couple of minutes, we will be joined by my good friend, Jamie Bradford, formerly of JB and Goldwater, now the co-host of the Inside the Gamecocks, the show, along with JC and Phil. And then at the bottom of the hour, we will be joined by Emily Adams, definitely the best looking guest on this show, uh, to talk some Gamecock football, and we will talk Gamecock women's basketball NCAA tournament. Two number one seeds are out. The madness is at an all-time level in women's college basketball. So first, I got to give my guy Shane uh, over in Franklin a big shout out. He's originally from Lamar played with John Abraham there, like me, a small town South Carolina guy who moved to Texas, has a customer in my area, and we hooked up and had lunch yesterday, and uh, just what a great time, two small town South Carolina guys in uh, Austin, Texas, talking about the Gamecocks, chopping it up, having a great time. Told me some stories that made me smile, some that made me laugh, and one that broke my heart. Um, But man, uh, what a great connection, long-time listener of the the podcast, and uh, could not have had a better time. And so, Shane, thanks for the invite. Thanks for stopping by and spending some time with me yesterday. All right, let's get to... The headlines of today, and we'll start with Dawn Staley, who was named the U.S. Basketball Writers Association National Coach of the Year for the second year in a row and winner of this award three of the last four years. Dawn Staley, also a finalist for the uh, Naismith National Coach of the Year. Uh, The Gamecocks are a perfect 34-0, and they lead the nation in opponents' uh, points per game, only giving up 50.6 points per game. They are number one in the nation in opponents' field goal percentage. Their opponents are only shooting a paltry 31% from the field. Offensively, the Gamecocks are sixth nationally in scoring at 81 points per game, and 11th in field goal percentage. If you can believe that, as bad as they miss shoot layups at times, uh, 47%, and no surprise, they are also the top 
shot blocking team in the country, averaging 9.1 blocks per game. Uh, there was a block party in Columbia for sure in the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. Aaliyah Boston is one of four finalists for the Naismith National Player of the Year. She's the only player to win Naismith National Player of the Year and National Defensive Player of the Year in the same year in women's basketball. So this would be a repeat for her. Of course, really, it's a two-person race. It's going to be Aaliyah Boston or it's going to be Caitlin Clark. The other two finalists, Elizabeth Kitley from Virginia Tech and Maddie Segrist from Villanova, who punched their ticket uh, to the Sweet 16, I think, on Monday. Yeah, they beat uh, Florida Gulf Coast, who upset Washington State in the first round. All right, Shane Beamer last night tweeted out another welcome home same picture as last time i think because quite frankly there's probably some similarities in these last two welcome homes uh, obviously we will wait on the prospects to announce i do know that both josiah thompson uh, Blake Franks, two offensive linemen from the state of South Carolina, both visited recently. Both have gotten recent crystal ball picks to South Carolina, as well as speedy Burlington Cummings High School wide receiver Jonathan Paylor, a guy that is a major priority in this class for Justin Stepp. I don't think we'll have to wait very long, and I expect – the welcome homes to continue throughout the spring. South Carolina, I think, is really shaping up to have probably a top, uh, at least a legitimate chance at a top 10 class. All right, former Gamecock linebacker and current Gamecock analyst Shaq Wilson, congrats to you, my man. He was hired by the New York Football Jets, J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 to become their assistant defensive line coach, following in the footsteps of South Carolina's defensive ends coach, Sterling Lucas, who was a college linebacker, Started coaching in college, then went to the NFL and became an assistant defensive line coach. I think one day I would love for Shaq Wilson to coach for the Gamecocks. I think he would be a great, great recruiter. And man, I am so happy for him. What a fantastic young man he is. All right, defensive players. Um, Met with the media today that just wrapped up when Emily joins the show. We will uh, get her take on that. Gamecock baseball, uh, they dropped a 6-2 to two decision last night to Charlotte, but they are off to a hot start. They were 20-1. and uh, one. They had an 11-game win streak that was snapped. But the Gamecocks are coming off of that sweep over Georgia this past weekend. The Gamecocks will host number 22, Missouri. The Tigers just swept the Tennessee Varmiteers, or volunteers, this past weekend. And so uh, we'll see what happens there. So I guess as we wait for uh, JB to join us, oh, there he is. Right on time, let's bring in the man himself, Jamie Bradford. Here we go. What's up, man? Hey, JB, how are you, brother? 
Oh, we're living the dream around here. How are you? Hey, I couldn't be doing better. Uh, took last week off for spring break, but back and better than ever and appreciate you joining the show. And so Gamecock baseball uh, had a little hiccup last night. They get their 11 game win streak snapped by Charlotte, but we didn't get to talk about it on Monday. Cause I know you had Derek Scott on, but you know, Gamecocks kind of played some weaker competition in the non-con schedule. Then they took two out of three from Clemson, bouncing back after dropping the first game of that series. You still didn't kind of know what to expect going into SEC play. But then I think for the first time since 2010, Gamecocks sweep Georgia in Athens and win uh, their first SEC game, I think, for the first time since 2017. But what a power display – and it started with kind of a nail biter in that first game. Game Cox, Will Sanders was pitching great, just cruising along, had a three to one lead. And then JB, do you think he just kind of ran out of gas? And maybe since he is Will Sanders, they just left him out there a little bit too long as he continues to ramp up. Well, you know, I, it, it's interesting because, you know, if you go back go back to the year 2000 when Kip Baltonite went 17-1 and won and won the Golden Spikes Award. And um, if you go back and look at a lot, of, a lot of his lines that year, you saw a lot of six innings, seven innings pitch. Back then you used to you, – you would go a little bit longer than, than a lot of these guys do now because so, so many of the bullpen roles are defined. But – You'd see six innings, seven innings, three runs given up on seven hits, three runs given up on six hits, two runs on five hits, four runs on on eight hits, whatever it was. And those were considered quality starts. Um, it gave his guys a chance to win the game. And um, and you fast forward now to where we are, and it's not just Will Sanders. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to answer your question. It's not just Will Sanders, but you're seeing it all over the place. Because guys throw are throwing ninety five to hundred. You know those guys back then. You know Kip was eighty eight to ninety one, and that was that was throwing hard. Um, the guys that I that I grew up with, uh, you know, if they were low nineties, that was throwing hard. Well, everybody's doing that now. So, you know, so so numbers have changed, and and what a quality start is has changed. But also when guys who pitch for a a long time in their careers and, and make an early impact like Will Sanders. And then you, you come into the season, you got all these first round draft pick projections on you and things like that. And you, um, you know, you, you go out there and you give up three or four runs. Uh, you, you, it's easier to, to, to scrutinize. Um, I don't think they really left him in too long. I, I just think he made two bad pitches in the game of all of everything that he threw. And, um, and, but, in the SEC, one bad pitch can get you beat, and we all know that. So, I, I, I'm not um, I'm not concerned about him. Uh, you know, I it'd be nice to see him. He hasn't had that whoa performance yet this year, right? I mean, that that moment where he walks off the field after six or seven innings, or maybe more, and he's thrown a hundred pitches, and seventy of them or more were for strikes, and he's got eleven Ks, and and it just looked easy and flawless in the whole nine yards. He hasn't had that. Uh, I think he will have that. Hopefully, he has it in a big moment. Maybe it starts on Friday. But um, but I think Carolina should still feel pretty good about where they are with Will Sanders. The other good thing is that if they need to, if he if they feel like they're in a game, let's say on Friday night when Missouri comes to town and they're like, man, we're just not going to be able to sc scrape a bunch against these guys, and and Will gives up a couple of runs and they feel like they need to hold him at bay, they have now the option – to be able to go to a guy like James Hicks, who although he closed last weekend, he can basically come in and you can almost – they're not going to do it this way, but it would technically be like a predetermined split. So they've got some great options, and luckily they're deep enough to give him a little little leniency uh, to, to get him where he needs to go. But my gut tells me by the end of the season, we're going to be looking at a bunch of performances from Will Sanders going, dude, this, this cat, he figured it out, and yeah, he is a first-rounder. Yeah, I mean, I hope we start 
seeing it against Missouri and then Mississippi State and then LSU. I mean, these next three series, I think, you know, I can't remember if it was you or Phil or somebody asked me what I expected of this team going into SEC play. And I didn't really know what to say. And I said, I wanted to see the first three or four series to kind of get a gauge. And so I don't want to overreact, but I mean, at Athens, this series reminded me of the one when Mike Morgan was calling games and your guy Smoke and Reese Havens and Darnell and those guys were just bombs away in Athens. I mean, the names changed to Ethan Petrie and Gavin Cassis and, you know, Talmadge Lee Croy and Wimmer. The names have changed, but that's the this is the first time I can remember since back then. It just seems like the Gamecocks just absolutely had a power surge in Athens and the ball was flying out of the yard. And, you know, you got to mention that big pinch hit by Michael Braswell off the bench against his home state school. And then the huge defensive play he made in the bottom of the ninth when he gets a ball you know, on the hot corner, he fields it cleanly, holds the runner at second, and then throws the guy out at first. What a big inning for him, and how do you think that could maybe springboard him to where he starts getting his number called again because that was uh, timely hitting and timely fielding for sure. Yeah, that was that was huge for him, Keith, and it was great to see. Um, we had Wingo on our show yesterday, and he kind of – I think maybe spilled the beans a little bit before Kingston was able to get the lineup out, but he had mentioned that Braswell would be in it last night, and he had he had a tough night last night. You know, baseball is it's a harsh game. Uh, 0 for two, he struck out, and but that's not really what was glaring. Unfortunately, what what started the the tough turn of events for Carolina was that error uh, that he made when he airmailed it over over to Cassis, and then uh, they score a couple runs, and then bang, the three run homer off of Jerzenbeck. With that said, though, I mean. You know, credit to John Whittle because he's been reporting this uh, for a little while now that the last few weeks have been, or the last couple of weeks at least, for for Michael Braswell have been um, better. And he's used the word engaged, where it seems like he's maybe kind of kind of refocused himself on being the best that he can be. This team needs him. There's no doubt. You you got to have a guy like Michael Braswell. He's really talented. There's a reason why so many people recruited him. Uh, was he beaten out this year? You could you could argue that certainly because he hasn't played much, and the other guys have, um, you know. But but they need him, and and I think regardless of what happened last night in a strange weeknight game, which everybody across the country has lost those this year. And that's that's baseball. Not not making excuses. It's just happened. Uh, what happened last week in Athens? I do think that will have a, a big impact on him because. Where he gets his name called down the line is not it it it's not it's not about the fact will he or won't he he will but it's but it's going to be where and is and is, is, is that he gets another start or that they need him to come off the bench again or whatever it may be um, you know one of the things that made Coach Tanner so great was he was able to identify roles for guys and if you were a starter. You were a starter, but if you were a if you were a reliever, if you were a big bat off the bench, if you were a late inning guy, whatever it was, you know you 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 understood your role playing for Coach Tanner, and you accepted it. And if you didn't accept it, you just probably weren't going to be around very long because everybody knew that they had a role and they had to do that role the best best that they possibly could. And that's what made his team so great year in and year out. I mean, guys like Ro- Robbie Grindstaff and and John Willard, and these are names that people probably haven't heard of in a long time. But when John Willard came in the game, he knew what his job was. It was to hit a ball over the over the wall, and if not, hit it off the wall. Um, and so, you know, it it's not that easy, but he certainly, you know, he 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 owned that. So I don't know what Braswell's role is going to be. I'm not Coach Kingston or anybody on that staff. But what I do hope is that he owns it, and if he, if he does, that's going to make them that much better. I mean, no doubt about it. So, hey, the, 
you know, we knew kind of going into this season, Braylon Wimmer was going to be the guy. Uh, he won the shortstop uh, job that Braswell had last year. We knew what he could do at the plate. But Ethan Petrie, Gavin Cassis, I mean, yeah, they were hitting some bombs against, quite frankly, some weaker competition, but they haven't slowed down. That did not stop against Clemson, and it certainly did not stop against Georgia. I mean, just talk about those guys, Cole Messina, Talmadge Lee Croy, and this offense and just how it has been completely different through, you know, at least 22 games now as compared to the last few years when, you know, there just wasn't a whole lot of runs, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. Um, first of all, Petri is uh... – <laughs> you know it's 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 hard to explain a, a freshman who's done what he's done I, I've, I've at least been saying this since day one okay you know at some point in time he's going to hit the skids because and he is that is still going to happen I predicted it would have happened much sooner than now um it hasn't I, he didn't have a great night last night but nobody did um and so my, my big thing with Petri was is watching him. Okay, well, how's he gonna how's he gonna respond, both physically and mentally? How's he gonna work himself through that? Um, you know, Coach Coach Lee and and Coach King and um, and Scotty and those guys when when they work with him, you know, what 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 will it be that helps get a young kid who's hit the skids as a freshman through it? Because he's obviously showed what he's capable of doing. But what I found is. Um, he's, uh, he, he's, he's got some professional hitter in him and, uh, he adjusts from game to game. He adjusts from at bat to at bat, and then he adjusts within the at bat and you just can't ask for much more than that. You know? So whenever he does start to struggle a little bit, whenever that is, maybe, and hopefully it's never, but it, you know, it's baseball. So he will at some point, uh, it'll really be more from a mental side of, of getting him through it physically. He's. He knows how to do it. Um, he, he's proven that. But I think overall with this offense, it, there's a collection of things that always need to be in the conversation as to, as to the why, at least thus far. Um, number one, they do have better players. Uh, there are better players in this offense. Number two, they have older players in this offense. I know we just mentioned Petri, and he's a young guy. He is. But Messina is now a sophomore. Lee Croy is now a sophomore. Will McGill has transferred in uh, from Southern Miss. He's done this before. Gavin Cassis, not an everyday guy at Vanderbilt, but he is an SEC guy, um, and he's been around a while. Braylon Wimmer speaks for himself. Caleb Denny has struggled. That's not going to be the case all year. Don't look at his batting average. He is much better than that. I, I have thought since the first time I saw him up there, Keith, for the, the Penn Series, when I saw it with my own two eyes, I was watching him take BP, and I looked at Wingo. I said, Scotty, kid's a professional hitter he goes he is um so he he's he's gonna be fine but another kid you know has been around played at Oral Roberts so you've you got older guys you got talented guys and you got healthy guys and 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 I think that's how Monty would want it said I mean there's no doubt that he's made an impact you know they've changed their approach you know str strikeouts are kind of coming with their approach walks HBPs power don't get cheated in your hacks and things like that um and um, and so there's no doubt that Coach Kingston and Coach Lee and all those guys collectively have helped this group get better. But also, you got to tip your cap to the players, and, and you put all this into one jar, and you're, you're going to get a better offense. Now, could we have seen it being better? Is what it is? I don't know. I'm not sure of any people, anybody that predicted that. Um, but it's contagious sometimes when you swing it well, and and for the large majority of the season, they've been doing that. Yeah, no doubt. So. The same people that predicted that predicted uh, fairly Dickinson uh, and Furman to win their first round games right in March right. Madness. So, Marty Lee, you mentioned him obviously taking over for a guy that I had a lot of respect for, Chad Kaye. Mm -hmm. 
What are, I mean, is it kind of a nuanced difference? Is it a kind of continuation of the same approach or is it a different approach? And how much does Monty Lee's experience being at South Carolina and in the SEC and in the state uh, and as a head coach helped this offense and this baseball program? Well, I'm glad you said what you said because I, I didn't know Chad Kaye. Um, I don't, I don't remember meeting him um, at all. I, but as far as knowing somebody, I did not know him. Um, but I knew a lot about him just based on the guys that were around him. You know, the dude that hired him, Coach Kingston, uh, Scott Wingo, and um, and then Monty. You know, has said it publicly, and and I think we've even talked about this privately. You know, Chad Kaye is a really good coach, and and quite frankly, if he was still here this year, this team would be better offensively as well. So, um, and that's not to take away any anything from Coach Lee or anybody on the staff. But so, uh, you know, that gets lost in a lot of this, Keith. And I'm glad you said it. He's got a great track record. And maybe he'll get back in the game someday. Hopefully we'll see him again somewhere. Um, you know, so, so with Monty, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn because, I, you know, I'm not in there every day. I mean, I know a lot of his philosophies. I've known him a long time. Um, you know, one of the things he often says is don't get cheated. If you're going to swing it, swing it. Um, you know, they, they do work on understanding the strike zone, which makes it much more difficult when you have an umpire who doesn't know how to call the strike zone. Uh, that, that can happen from time to time. You're sitting here going, what? What's important in that is you, we have to remember these are kids. They need to understand something. You might understand the strike zone, but every call isn't going to go your way. So when it doesn't, you got to move on. Uh, you, you, you cannot overwhelm yourself with what just happened there. You're an umpire, Keith. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, the things that I can speak on uh, with, with Monty are just things that are just known, collect, you know, widespread and collectively in this state. He has relationships with everybody. Uh, he's honest. Um, he has – he understands the South Carolina baseball program from his time coaching with coach Tanner, but he also understands it because he grew up in Lugoff and he played at the college of Charleston. He played against Carolina. He hit three home runs in, in one game up there. They lost the Cougars did uh, playing for coach Sibiteri, but, but he's, he has long understood this program as well as any in the state. And he knows what type of kids that it takes to get there. A lot of the kids that won the first world series were Monty Lee guys. You know, he's the one that started recruiting a lot of those guys. Um, but he also understands how to recruit this state, which I think is something that we've we've struggled with for the last few years. Which is that can't happen in, Car in, in with Carolina baseball. You know, they they've long pretty much gotten anybody they wanted within our borders, and that's changed. Um, and 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 but you know these kids want to play for him because they understand that the things that he teaches are things that make them a better player. And um, and he really relates well to guys, and it's neat to hear him teach things like broad focus and fine focus and all these things that it takes to be a, a good, complete hitter. So there's a lot to unpack with him and his impact on the program. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, he, he's a guy that the guys trust. And if you grew up in South Carolina and you're playing at South Carolina now, you've, you've long known who he is and you're probably – well, not probably. I, I know that those guys are just honored to walk out there every day and get coached by him. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's honestly the highest praise you can give a guy, quite frankly. So let's switch to the pitching staff. Obviously, we talked about Will Sanders, Jack Mahoney coming back from injury, Noah Hall on the weekend. Those guys have been dominant. Uh, just your your thoughts on those guys and what they have done in their weekend starts. Well, they're healthy, uh, starting with Jack Mahoney. You know, again, that, that, that goes back to last year. You've got him healthy. He's 3-0 and through five starts, and his ERA is 2-6, and he's throwing it well. And as the weather warms up, you feel like these guys, as long as they stay healthy, will only get better. And, and big time hats off to Billy Anderson and Coach Kingston and Justin Parker for really managing this staff because God knows they don't want to go through what they went through last year again. Um, they've been doing everything in their power for months on end to make sure that they could stay healthy. So, you know, it starts with those guys. And then, you know, I, I personally think 
that the MVP of the pitching staff so far is James Hicks. Uh, he he's just man, he's awesome. I mentioned to Drew uh, Drew Meyer yesterday, Keith, that he, he I'm not comparing them side by side because they're different eras, and this isn't going to happen like it used to happen. But but Scott Barber used to close games on Friday and turn around and start on Sunday. Yeah, at South Carolina, the kid, part one of the, of the killer, killer bees. That's right. And and that staff was damn good. I mean, you know, Kip won the Golden Spikes. Uh, Peter Bauer won, I think, 12 games in 2000. And I think Scott Barber won nine, but also had like 13 saves or something ridiculous. Um, but but my, my point is he was a guy who you trusted in multiple roles. And that's kind of where James Hicks is. God forbid they felt like they needed to make a move on the weekends. He's probably number one who's who's sliding into that starting role. Yeah. At the at the same time, Keith. I mean, if you go out this Friday night and you're in a one run ball game with Missouri late, he's probably also the guy you're going to there. We mentioned this earlier. You know, if Sanders or it, it, it doesn't matter who it is, anybody any of their starters this weekend have to come out somewhere in the middle innings. And you feel like okay, we need to steady the ship and ride at home, and he's available. Guess what? He's coming in there. Uh, so I just feel like he's been kind of the MVP. I love how he carries himself. It's a college baseball has become very emotional. Some of it I like, some of it I can't stand. Some of it it is what it is. Um, this guy, he he walks up on the mound, he pitches, he walks off the mound, and um, and I really love seeing that. Yeah, I mean. That was honestly the next name I was going to bring up because of just, you know, he's kind of a Swiss Army knife kind of guy for this pitching staff. He can shine in any role, whether it's a starter, a late inning guy, a closer, or he has to come in after three innings and go, and go the distance. He can do it. But – what about Chris Veach and some of the big moments he's had and Eli Jones and uh, Jerzen Beck and, and Becker? I mean, those, those guys uh, have done a lot of good things for this pitching staff. Yeah, they do. Or they have. Um, so last night, although the, the scoreboard certainly was not what everybody wanted it to be at the end of it, uh, that is that is teaching. We've all we've all coached Keith, or not all, but a lot of us have coached. Um, that's that's teaching moment one hundred and one right there. Uh, Coach Kingston hit the nail on the head afterwards. Couldn't have said it any better. If you were watching the game, we you probably thought it like like many people did. It kind of went off the rails a little bit for Eli. He didn't get a couple of close calls that he probably should have gotten. Braswell air mails a throw, and he just didn't handle it well. Uh, he was, it was, it was a, a sign of immaturity on the mound. I'm not saying that personally at all. I'm saying that just as a player. We, if you've played any sport, you've you've had these moments, and um, and as it was pointed out to me this morning by another uh, pitching coach in college baseball, we were texting actually about that performance. He said this is that was probably the first time he's ever actually really struggled like that, where you didn't get a call, you had an error. You were you were frustrated, and the guy hits the ball out of the yard, and he's just freaked out. He's freaking out. He doesn't know what to do. Um, so I'm, I'm I'd really be curious to to hear the conversations, either during or post game last night with with Coach Parker and and if Coach Kingston had some of those with him as well. What they'll be like this week to get him. They're going to have to get him back in there. So he's going to have to pitch this weekend somewhere. Um, so that's a that's a great learning moment for him. As far as those other guys, man, I mean, yeah, um, Matthew Becker, Eli Jones. Uh, I mean, they just they they have good stuff. And uh, Chris Veach, who's got a couple of saves. I asked Kingston uh, was it last not last week, but the week before. I said, "Is Veach your closer?" He goes, "No, not necessarily." Uh, so that's a pretty good sign because he's put him out there to close twice, and he did it. And um, you know, but Hicks can close, and I, I think. Once Becker, Becker and Sanders, it seems to me, are kind of in very similar spots where they're, um, you know, he's, I think Becker's walked like eight guys this year in 10 innings. Sanders has only walked, I think, six or seven, if I remember correctly, in 28 innings. But 
there so like with Sanders, he's not walking a ton of guys, but he's just not locating his strikes very well. Like they're they're either they're either kind of fat and they're getting hit or they're they're their balls. Um so he's not walking a lot of guys, but Becker is is kind of nibbled and been around it. And so like once those guys get sharp, their stuff is so good that you're like, wow, okay, you know that you could easily go Sanders and then go to the lefty Becker and have a shutout. I mean, they're, they're that good. So it's just cleaning some things up and, you know, you just hope at some point in time that, um, that they have the performance that they need that'll carry them through. And, and it's coming, it's coming. They're, they're, they're so good. There's no, these guys have been singing their praises for so long. You know, that's not, that's not hogwash. I mean, there, there's a reason why they've been saying what they've been saying. They just need to have that moment where the light comes on and then they'll kick it into gear. All right, JB, great stuff. Huge series coming up against Missouri this weekend. They are fresh off a sweep over Tennessee, who uh, has kind of scuttled a little bit, which I don't mind. Uh, maybe my next guest might mind it a little bit, but uh, I don't mind. So, hey, thanks for being with us. Great stuff, as always. And uh, if I don't see you before, I'll see you on Monday on Inside the Gamecocks, the show. You got it, man. Appreciate you having me on, and uh, certainly enjoy it. Great stuff. We'll see you soon. All right, thanks. All right, that is Jamie Bradford coming up next. Emily Adams right after this message. If you enjoy listening and watching the free Wednesday show now live streaming on YouTube and would love more Gamecock Pod daily, join our growing Gamecock family by becoming a monthly or annual subscriber. You'll be able to listen to the show every day of the week and listen to guests like J.C. Sherbert, Hale McGranahan, and John Whittle from TheBigSpur.com, Colin Taylor and Mike Yuva from Gamecock Central, Emily Adams from The Greenville News, Ben Portnoy, Michael Lanana, and Jeremiah Holloway from GoGamecocks.com, Michael W. Bratton, the host of That SEC Podcast, and many, many more. As a VIP subscriber, you can join or listen to the weekly live Zoom call with up to 100 of your favorite Gamecocks and friends. After the show is an unrecorded overtime segment where the real scoop gets dropped in disgust. It's like going down to your local pub or sports bar and having a conversation with your Gamecock friends about last week's football game, men's and women's basketball games, and Gamecock baseball. And of course, there's always recruiting to discuss. In addition to the weekly Zoom call, VIP subscribers get the most popular podcast, The Morning After, which is released every Sunday morning during football season, and more VIP perks are in the works. Follow Keith on Twitter at KAllset or follow the show on Twitter at Gamecock Pod. Go to the top of the homepage and follow the link. If all else fails, go to patreon.com backslash Gamecock Pod Daily. Join now and get up to three months free off an annual VIP subscription. You will love it, guaranteed. Now, back to Gamecock Pod Live. <laughs> All right, let's welcome in our next guest, fresh off uh, a media gaggle with uh, some defensive players, Emily Adams. Emily, hello. How are you? Doing good. Yeah, it's it's been busy to say the least, but it's been fun, so can't complain. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll definitely get to uh, March Madness uh, in a few minutes, but I did want to start with some football stuff because on Monday uh, you got to meet with several offensive players. Yesterday, uh, Shane Beamer held court for his normal 30-minute uh, uh, Tuesday session, and now today several defensive players – and so, of all the guys you've listened to and talked to, what's kind of been some of the biggest takeaways uh, thus far? Yeah, it's been interesting just because the team is kind of in an odd spot coming into this year where it's either very veteran or very new at kind of every spot. You know, you bring back Juice, you bring back Spencer, you know, that 
so much of the wide receiver room is veteran guys, you know, you're the offensive skill players are kind of that, that core, but then you look at so many other spots. I mean, so much of the O-line, the whole tight end room is new. And, and then defensively, obviously a lot of turnover in the secondary, uh, still a lot of questions at edge. So it's, it's interesting where they're sort of having to toe that line of being both a very experienced and a very young team at the same time. Um, but it seems like the vibes are good inside the building. Um, haven't heard anything but good things about Dow Logan so far. He seems to, you know, the players seem to really like him, obviously. The biggest question for him has always been about the play calling. So we're not, you know, won't get an answer on that for a little while. But from a pure sort of personality, coaching, implementing the system standpoint, it seems like all of that's been going really well. Everybody seems pretty happy with it. Um, yeah, so it's it's been good so far. It's I've I've gotten pretty good impressions from from the early <laughs> conversations we've had. Yeah, so I mean that's kind of been one of the things that stuck out to me. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's kind of one of the biggest takeaways I got as a as a former coach and as a guy who uh, was not always sold on the on the former guy. We, we don't mention his name on this podcast, but it seems like. Dowell Loggins is the anti-former guy. Like when you hear players talk about having no fear on the practice field, playing free, uh, streamlining, you know, uh, Spencer Rattler on the Bussing with the Boys podcast mentioned one play that was like 15 words. Imagine having a hundred plays on a wristband like that and trying to get 11 people all on the same page and five offensive linemen who really have to act like a fist, right? Like you have five guys that maybe I need to do it with that hand. There we go. And so you have five fingers, right? If you try to punch somebody with your fingers, you're really not going to hurt them. You're going to hurt yourself. But when you – act in unison as one, it can have a powerful effect. And I think it's going to be better for the offensive line. And it's certainly when guys can play free and not worry about just being dog cussed in front of everybody and thinking about, oh, my God, I can't make this mistake or what am I supposed to do? It is a completely different mindset for players who can play free, who can have fun, and who can play fast. Yeah, and I mean, I think especially, you know, with the O-line, it's a lot of those guys aren't necessarily experienced, but most of them are veteran. You know, a lot of them, you know, were kind of that second string group last year. Um, and then it seems like the transfers they've brought in have clicked really well. I mean, everybody has good things to say about, uh, Nick or Julio from, from Yale. Um, I expect him to be a pretty ha- strong contender for that starting center spot. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it just, it seems like even, you know, with, with Lonnie Teasley, you know, everybody's had good things to say about him kind of stepping into that O-line coach role. So it, it seems like things are, are trending the way you want them to during spring practice where you really do want to, you know, get so much of that implementation and and those basics taken care of before you get into the real, you know, season time. No doubt. So one major position on offense where there's a lot of question marks because there aren't a lot of players is running back. And there's a new guy uh, who's playing running back. And a guy that a lot of people thought when he came out of high school probably should have been a running back. And that is to carry on Joyner. And so from talking to him, uh, his teammates uh, and coaches, to me, I think this is really something to monitor going forward. I do think South Carolina needs to add more from the transfer portal in the May period, but you just don't know. I mean, that's kind of like a a box of chocolates. Like you just don't know what you're going to get right now. Yeah. 
But I think over the course of, of 11 more practices, I think they will know what they can get. And based off the early returns, I really think Dakirian Joyner could be the starting running back when South Carolina plays North Carolina in Charlotte. Yeah, it, it really wouldn't surprise me at all, honestly. Um, I mean, I think it, it makes sense for him. You know, it just it seems like a good fit. He's, you know, a bigger guy than Juju is or or even than Mario Anderson is. You know, they need somebody who has that size aspect of being a running back as opposed to just sort of the, the flat speed and the shiftiness that a guy like Juju really kind of leans on. Um, and, and I mean, Shane has said it, good things happen when DK is on the field and the ball's in his hands. It doesn't matter where he is. It's usually ends up being a pretty good play. So I, I think, you know, if that's going to be a way for them to get him more touches, even, you know, as a receiving running back, I think is an interesting spot for him. You know, it's, it's definitely not a bad move. And considering the depth they've got in that wide receiver room, they don't really need him there per se. Um, you know, that, with with juice with Amari Brown with Xavier Leggett with Eddie Lewis is a guy who um, we've heard a lot about from from coaches and players during the first couple weeks of spring practice. You know, I think it's a it's a good fit for what they need right now. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see. We've got open practice tomorrow, so we'll see if we take see him take any running back reps. But I I think it's a really it's a really smart move by that coaching staff just to try it out and see. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I think Dow Loggins could do some interesting things there because if you've got the Kerry and Joyner and Spencer Rattler side by side in the shotgun formation, you don't know who necessarily is going to take the snap, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so I think that could make for some interesting offense. I, I do worry about his durability because he has – had a history of, of injuries at times, but I mean, there, there's still a long way to go there, but I do think it's a very intriguing storyline for this offense, along with some other new players like Eddie Lewis, like Trey Knox and the rest of the newbies at tight end, because they're all newbies, whether they're transfers or true freshmen. I mean, you do hear Trey Knox's name a lot. That's quite frankly not a surprise. Uh, another guy, Joshua Simon. Just what do you make uh, of this rebuilt tight end room? Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I think, especially you know, Josh and Trey are newbies, obviously in the you know technical sense, but both of them are fifth year guys. They've played a lot of football. Um, Trey Knox has played a lot of football with Dow Loggins specifically and in the SEC. Um, so I think the transition really isn't as hard as it could have been, you know, especially with Trey, but also with Josh, just kind of having so many years of playing behind him. Um, I, I mean, Trey, I don't know how many of y'all have seen him in person. He's enormous. <laughs> um, and he's real quick for how big he is. So uh, he's definitely one I think is, is going to be really exciting for them. Um, and yeah, I mean, some of those younger guys, those true freshmen, I think it's hard. It's similar to like an O-line or D-line to me where I think it's hard as a true freshman to fit in at a tight end role just because your body's not there yet. Um, but, you know, Nick Elksness obviously has been at Florida, you know, is used to the SEC a little bit more, but has dealt with some injury issues. So that's kind of the big, the big question mark with him. But it's not a bad room considering what they lost. You know, you look at that group and you don't, it doesn't feel like a downgrade from what they were working with last year. Yeah. I, I mean, I totally agree. So switching to defense, I thought Dave Cloninger maybe had the, the question that was most on my mind that nobody's really talked about. And that is for Clayton white, improving the run defense. When South Carolina's defense is at its best, they're getting turnovers. They do that extremely well. But when they're not, because of per I think because of personnel, because of limitations, particularly at linebacker, I think they've that's why they've struggled so much to stop stop the run. 
Uh, Mo Caba, your best linebacker, was injured in game two last year. I thought Sherrod Green played really well. I think he and Mo Caba, if they're playing together all of last year, I do think the run defense is a lot better. I, you know, Brad Johnson's a guy that is from my neck of the woods, and my dad worked his entire career in Pendleton, South Carolina. I squared off against the Bulldogs. They were in our uh, conference. But he was just a guy who could never really find a home in a position and, and never really seemed comfortable. Now Mokaba's out this spring, and it's essentially all new guys. Stone Blanton, you know, certainly we saw him get taken advantage of in the bowl game. Uh, he's – leaned up he's gotten quicker i'm all for seeing that uh jaron willis the old miss transfer who uh, played with juju mcdowell is out there and you have some other guys as well but to me it really is going to start at linebacker uh but just i mean to me clayton white's a guy that's on the hot seat this year quite frankly i mean South Carolina beat Tennessee not because they could really stop them. I mean, they hung 63 on them. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like Clemson, it was 31 to 30. And then the bowl game, I can't really blame him because of all the defections and the guys that transferred out. They just ran out of gas. But to me, something's got to change, particularly with the run defense going into this year. Yeah, I think, and I do think a lot of that last year was partly a personnel problem, you know, with with losing Strawn and, and Kaba so early when that, you know, those two had really settled, settled in as the starters. You know, Sherrod Green, Sherrod Green was still a little bit injured coming into last year, um, you know, and obviously had, you know, a ton of health problems throughout his career. Um, so I, I think they've ended up in a tough spot. And I think one of the things that I've always – liked about the way Clayton coaches is just that South Carolina's defense always seemed to get better after halftime. Um, and I think a coach who can make adjustments is always a good sign. You know, it's something, it's something Don Staley is very good at, you know, when you look at, at that, that sort of thing. But I think where they're struggling right now is just with the development side of things with getting guys in the building who are able to, you know, actually, execute things at the SEC level the way that they they want to see them. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, this recruiting class does have a, a lot of defensive guys in it, um, not necessarily at linebacker, but a lot of, you know, guys who came in as defensive linemen or as defensive backs that could kind of shift around there. So it's, yeah, I think, I think this definitely is going to be sort of a telling, a telling year if it looks the same as last year, or if it is, you know, continuing to move forward. And I think that's sort of the biggest thing to look for. So South Carolina has to replace several guys in the secondary as well. But honestly, I think if you're Shane Beamer, if you're Clayton White, you can have comfort in the fact that Torian Gray uh, <laughs> is in charge of that room you do have Marcella Dial and O'Donnell, soldier of fortune, uh, coming back. Obviously, both made key plays uh, down the stretch for South Carolina. Uh, Dial with a big interception uh, against uh, DJ uh, Ukulele, uh, formerly of Clemson, and and then OD Fortune, a 100 plus yard interception return that quite frankly put the Gamecocks back in it and tied the game late in Jacksonville. To me, those are, are things that they can build on, but I, I also think there's a lot of talented younger guys behind them. Yeah. I mean, even you look at Nikki Memori and DQ Smith played a ton of reps last season. I mean, both of them were, I mean, true starters by the end of, of last year. Um, and that's as true freshmen, you know, they, and, and neither of them as super highly touted recruits who, you know, came in as a ready to play type of guy. So, you know, for them to do what they did in the situation they were in last year, I, I think 
I mean, really only sets them up for more success this year. I can't imagine either of them are going to like regress or anything. I think, you know, it's, it's only up from what we saw from them last year. Um, and, and again, I mean, they were stepping into the shoes of, you know, senior veteran guys who had really been staples in that secondary and just, and really didn't miss a beat. So I think, yeah, the, the future in that room is, is not one that I'm concerned about. Yeah. I mean, it's not ideal when a true freshman leads your team and tackles. Uh, the last guy to do it though was Sky Moore and he did it every single year he played. So, um, and you don't necessarily like a safety to lead your team in tackles either because that says that a lot of plays are going, you know, past the second level. So we'll see. I think Pup Howard is a huge piece of that puzzle. And then just like at running back, I mean, nobody really jumps out at edge, right? Like, I think you have to hope Jordan Strawn comes back and you have to hope by game one, Desmond Yumi Azulu is ready to go. Or you hit the jackpot in the transfer portal in May, just like you hope to do at running back at edge because there's not a lot of numbers. Obviously, we don't know if Montague Rames will or will not be with the team. He's another true freshman that now I don't even think you can count on simply because He's not getting the benefit of spring practice. He's not getting the benefit of being in the weight room now because of the suspension. So I think a lot of questions, but to me, a lot of depth in the middle uh, of the front of that defense with Boogie Huntley, Tonka Hemingway, TJ Sanders, Nick Barrett, Xavier McLeod is a guy, DeAndre Martin, and you know there are other guys as well to me that and the and the safeties are to me the strength of the of the defense right now as far as the knowns and the numbers uh for the defense yeah no i think that's the the correct assessment i think that's definitely the the areas that come back in with kind of a clear leader you know, some, some guys who earned, you know, a lot of reps last year who have some of that veteran experience who can kind of help mold some of these, you know, younger four-star guys coming in. Um, Yeah. Edge, edge, I think is just going to be the big question mark, you know, even with Terrell Dawkins is also coming back from injury with Strawn. Um, Mokaba still coming back from injury. Like they're just not healthy. So it's, it's hard right now to look at that and go, okay, these are the clear starters. You know, this is where everything's going to fit together. Um, so, I mean, I know Kaba and Strawn, and I believe Dawkins as well. I don't think any of them will be full go at any point in spring practice. So we're going to kind of have to wait and see, I think, until the summer for that, for that grouping. All right. So let's switch gears and, uh, talk women's basketball and, uh, I did not have uh, Stanford and Indiana being eliminated in the second round on my bingo card. No, I I don't think anyone did. (laughs) I mean, I'll have to say this. Um, It seems like Stanford, their only two viable scoring options were Haley Jones and the flopper Cameron Brink. Uh, obviously an Academy Award winning actress over the course of her career, the biggest faker flopper uh, that I've ever seen. But Ole Miss overwhelmed them with their quickness and athleticism and their defense and toughness, I thought. Yeah, that that upset was a lot less surprising to me than – Indiana Miami was um because I mean Ole Miss was under seated at an eight I think that we we all can agree on at this point um Ole Miss was better than an eight most of the year Ole Miss probably should have been ranked for most of the year um and, and so that that loss especially just from a matchups perspective you know that that was not the kind of team that Stanford wanted to run into especially that in, in that early of a round. And, and, you know, they hit that problem where, 
you know, Hannah Jump is sometimes amazing, goes, you know, three or four at the three point line. And then sometimes she doesn't. And when she doesn't, you know, it, it really is all on Haley and on Cam. Um, and I thought Ole Miss did a phenomenal job of kind of keeping Haley under control, especially. Um, I mean, Cam, Cam still kind of had her way, you know, that that triple block was <laughs> I, I remember watching that and going, oh, Ole Miss, I don't know if they have this, but. Uh, I mean, they just really, you know, Coach Yo game planned the hell out of that, and and it worked. I mean, they just stuck to it. They did the same thing they did against South Carolina, really. I mean, they had a game plan. They came in, and they ran it from buzzer to buzzer. And, you know, with Stanford, they had that last little bump to close it out that they couldn't against South Carolina when it when they ended up in overtime. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's time to say that, uh, I was wrong that uh, maybe the SEC was not uh, down. Four teams in the Sweet 16, obviously South Carolina, Ole Miss, LSU, and Tennessee. I mean, conceivably, you could have an all-SEC Final Four because it is one team in each regional. I'm not uh, expecting that. That, uh, but it's, quite I mean, it's far from impossible, I think. It's it's a lot less likely, uh, or it's a lot more likely than it realistically should be. <laughs> I agree. I completely agree. I mean, I think Ole Miss will have their hands full uh, with Louisville, who just, yeah. you know, you, you and I both were just not high on the Big 12 as a league, and they did not impress. Louisville <laughs> boat raced. Texas and honestly thought UCLA just got bored against Oklahoma because they were up so much. And then Oklahoma got back in it. And then UCLA, UCLA had to say, all right, okay. wake up. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and uh, dispose of these guys. But Indiana, what? Well, no, let's stay on this on the Stanford bracket because now Iowa <laughs> Looks like they could be on a collision course with South Carolina. This, I think, would be the dream uh, matchup in Dallas for ESPN, for the committee, for the Naismith voters, even though the award will already uh, be announced, which I don't think it <laughs> should be uh, until after the Final Four. But Iowa... Colorado took down Duke, really was not expecting that. Uh, yeah. I just thought Duke just ran out of gas. And then Louisville, who I didn't really think was that good. No, I didn't either. <laughs> they're, they're, now they're, 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 they're peaking, I think, at the right time. Haley Van Lith, obviously a go-to player, but they have others as well. And so – you know, and then in South Carolina's bracket, it's chalk. It is the top four seeds. That rematch with UCLA is on deck for Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 Central, uh, when I will be calling high school baseball, <laughs> unfortunately. And, and then you've got Notre Dame and Maryland. And Notre Dame, to me, even without Olivia Miles, who I thought was the straw that stirred the drink. They uh, have been impressive in the win over, um, you know, Southern Utah and then dispensing of Mississippi State, another SEC team. Yeah. Uh, but they're really going to be tested because Diamond Miller looks like a player on a mission right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean – Diamond is one of those who has just every game. It feels like she gets better. I mean, she's just so fun to watch right now. And that's why, I mean, if I'm South Carolina, I would much rather Notre Dame win that game. Cause you know, I think it's, it's a really tough position for them having played Maryland without diamond Miller. Cause you essentially have to throw that game plan out. I mean, you, that is a fundamentally different game than the one that they would play with diamond on the court. So I think that is is going to be a, a interesting matchup if we get to that point. Obviously, with between 
Notre Dame and Maryland, which I think will will probably be a great game. I mean, Notre Dame, yeah, has really exceeded the expectations for me without Olivia. I thought Mississippi State had a chance to knock them off in that game. Um, but unfortunately, just I, I feel like they just sort of ran out of gas there at the end. But I mean, what a season for them to even to even make it to that that stage. Um, and yeah, I mean, UCLA, I said, I mean, that that matchup, I think, is one of the toughest on the bracket left for them. I mean, it, you know, you look at Iowa in the final four. No part of that concerns me for South Carolina. You know, even Maryland, I, you know, I, I don't think. I think they will put up a much better fight than they did the first time, but I, I don't see them, you know, being just kind of in that same league with South Carolina right now. Uh, UCLA is just such an interesting matchup because they, you know, they play so fast. And I think you saw that with Oklahoma. I mean, they were just running the floor. Um, and the biggest problem with that is that they, they run out of gas too. You know, they get tired and that's what you saw in that third quarter of that game. But if they can keep that pace going, I mean, that, that pace is what puts South Carolina behind when they played them the first time. They're the only team the entire year to give South Carolina a single digit game at home. The only one, um, you know, they're, they're up at halftime at colonial life arena. You know, that, that is not something that many teams in the last three years can say they've done. Um, and, you know, obviously South Carolina is in a very different place than it was in November so is UCLA, who's, you know, starting Kiki Rice as a true freshman. I would posit, you know, she's making bigger jumps than a lot of seniors are as a true freshman over, you know, three months playing in the Pac-12. So that uh, that game I'm really, really excited for. I think it's going to be a very good game. Um, I think at, at least for a half, it will be a very close game. Um, and then after halftime is where we'll sort of we'll, we'll sort of see what happens. <laughs> All right, so I, I'm going to agree with uh, the studio folks at ESPN who said, you know, when, when you play South Carolina the second time, it's generally worse yeah. than the first time. And I think South Carolina is a completely different team. I think, yeah. you know, Raven Johnson, I think, played three minutes maybe in the, in the first game. I, I think at that point, uh, both, she and uh, Key were on minutes restriction. And so you had a lot of Zia Cook at point guard. I don't think we saw the complete depth of South Carolina at that point in the season. And so I, I still think South Carolina is the only team that can beat South Carolina. And yeah, when you look at the first two rounds – there's a lot to like, but there's also some things to be concerned about, like going 12 for 28 on layups yeah, and going and missing 15 free throws in the first round game. I mean, these are, are the things that, I mean, quite frankly, if Georgia made layups, they would have beaten Iowa, yeah. who <laughs> really does not concern me because I think, just like Indiana, they do not have the athleticism to keep up. I think probably Maryland is a, the most athletic team left in South yeah. Carolina's bracket. I do like UCLA. UCLA, though, can space you and can hurt you from three, and they can also put it on the deck. And so South Carolina's defense is going to be critical but then again, South Carolina is the number one defensive team in the country in points allowed, 50.6, and opponents' field goal percentage at 31.2%. And I don't think either team South Carolina played even shot 30% uh, yeah. in the first two rounds. And so I thought, Emily, that South Florida game – after the first quarter and South Carolina figured out how to play the staggers, I thought that was maybe as dominant a defensive performance as we've seen from them. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's why Iowa is so sort of uninteresting to me as a matchup, just because I mean, Iowa's defense, I think ranks outside of the top 300 
like one of the only five power i think one of the only power five defenses that ranks worse is is oklahoma um so i mean for for a team that is that weak defensively against you know a team like south because because iowa what they really rely on so much of the time is just being able to score more than their opponent they average three points more a game than South Carolina does with one of the worst defenses in the country. So, I mean, that matchup, I, I just don't, I don't even see it being competitive almost. I mean, unless, you know, Caitlin Clark goes into God mode and, and puts up 50, which she's certainly capable of doing, but again, against, you know, the number one defense in the country, that's not such an easy feat. Um, yeah. I mean, I think with UCLA, just the thing that's, that's so interesting to me about them is that speed because South Carolina for, you know, as much size as it has, it's not fast in the way that UCLA is fast. I mean, charisma Osborne is a shifty, shifty player to try to guard. I mean, she looked really, really good in that Oklahoma game. She's looked like that all season. Um, She had 24, 25, I think last time they played South Carolina. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's why that's how they sort of took Raven out of the game was that Raven plays that real fast sort of chaotic passing style and UCLA moved so quickly that they were outpacing her on that. They they could kind of make that ineffective. And that's why I think, you know, Kiara came in and put up a double double and had such an incredible game against them, you know, because she is that more sort of methodical, steady, can pull up and hit that mid range shot type of player. Um, so I think that's that's one of the most interesting things for me in this matchup, again, is where we see that Kiera Raven balance fall and whether UCLA can kind of keep that going the way that they did last time. I'm so happy for Kara Fletcher because she looks like the player now that she was two years ago, which was the last time she played. Like the game has slowed down. She's comfortable now with her teammates, with her new team, with her role. And um, I think that just means trouble for every other point guard in the tournament. So let's look at the other side of the bracket. I mean, Virginia Tech is the one seed, but UConn, as long as they have everybody that's playing right now, to me – I mean, they are the betting uh, number two choice to make the Final Four behind South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina, the overwhelming favorite still. But UConn, I don't know. I mean, Elizabeth Kitley, I think it's going to be very interesting if that is the matchup because that's what's really given – UConn problems is teams that play defense and have a legitimate post player that doesn't have to have their back turned to the basket on the block. And Elizabeth Kitley is similar to Aaliyah Boston in that she can face up, whether it's in the corner, at the elbow, in the circle, and she can play off the dribble and she can shoot. Yeah, I mean – I, I am not counting Tennessee out of that Virginia Tech game. I, I think that is a very, very dangerous game for Virginia Tech. I mean, I know Tennessee just played Toledo, which is not, you know. <laughs> is Holy no, Toledo. Is no Virginia Tech, but, I mean, they looked really incredible in that game, just clicking. I mean, Rakia Jackson and Jordan Horston did not have great games, and they just dominated. I mean, Tennessee just never looked back in that game. Um and they've played Virginia Tech already. They saw them, you know, back in, I think, November when they were really kind of going through it <laughs> early in the year. Um, and I believe they only lost that game by three. Um, this current Tennessee team is much, much better than the Tennessee team that played Virginia Tech in November. Um, and, you know, again, obviously everybody's in a different place now than they were then. But for that game to be that close when Tennessee was was doing that poorly – overall early in the year um that does not bode well to me for for Kenny Brooks and his and his group I mean I just I I think so much stock has been put in that ACC tournament run that they made but you know it's an ACC tournament where Olivia Miles was freshly out and you know Duke and North Carolina 
taking each other out in the early rounds. And so, you know, it just, they, they did not have as difficult of a path through that tournament as they, they probably should have. Um, and so I think, I think Tennessee is going to give them a fight at the very least. And I would not at all be surprised to see the, the lady balls come out of that um, for the UConn rematch, which, I mean, talking of games that ESPN would love to have, Oh I yeah! I cannot imagine they're not cheering that one on. Will they? Will they play the Geno rant uh, after the first half? That's 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 the thing. Um, I mean, Tennessee is hot right now. They are peaking. They have two stars, and their supporting cast is also stepping up, defending, rebounding, knocking down open looks. I agree with you. I mean, that to me, that is maybe the second most intriguing game of the Sweet 16 uh, when you go to the Greenville 2 Regional because uh, Virginia Tech, uh, Tennessee, Ohio State, UConn, Ole Miss, Louisville, they're all flying to Seattle. All those Eastern teams flying to the West Coast, and then you've got UCLA coming from Los Angeles to Greenville. And in football and basketball, when teams from the West fly East and they have early games, they tend to struggle sometimes. So we'll see. But LSU and Utah. Yeah, to me, the, 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 win, the winner of this game is probably headed to the final four. Yeah. And and that would put Kim Mulkey and Dawn Staley on the opposite side of the bracket in Dallas. Yeah, I mean, it it would certainly be, I mean. Again, rematches that ESPN would love to see. Tennessee LSU was a pretty a pretty good game last time they they saw each other. That's right. Um, I, I don't think both games right I, overtime. I, I, LSU won, and then Tennessee puts them out in the SEC tournament after being down twenty four to ten. Yeah, yeah. There, there is no love lost between those two teams. <laughs> uh, they, I mean that that would be a hot game <laughs> in if they meet in the final four um but i mean i think too i mean not to not to count villanova out but i think villanova if it runs into lsu or utah will probably have run its course i mean a, an incredible season for them an incredible season for maddie segrist but you know I, I think maddie can only take them so far unfortunately um and up against an angel reese or an Alyssa Peely, um I don't, I don't love their chances. I, I will say I have Utah in my final four. I've had them in my final four. Um, but it would not surprise me at all to see LSU knock them off the way they're playing right now. I mean, Angel has just looked incredible through their first couple of games. Uh, she, I mean, she dominated against Michigan. Um, and I think that's, that's where you want to be at, at this stage right now. This, this is <laughs> the time to, keep putting up those numbers and I mean I think three three out of four SEC teams in the final four is is not impossible at all uh, I would posit to say it's you know 60 40 maybe I think the tougher the tougher matchup there is Tennessee getting through UConn um which you know they they really had a hard time with last time but again I don't know that that would be impossible either just with kind of the the weird roller coaster UConn's been on lately because uh, Baylor I mean Baylor gave them a game for about three quarters um and it it, it kind of fell apart there at the end yeah I mean Alabama jumped all over Baylor and I just turned that game because I thought it was going to be a blowout and then the next day what Baylor whoa let me look this up so if there's one spoiler in the Sweet 16 that you can see spoiling it and making it to the Final Four, who would it be? Yeah, I mean, I'm tempted to say Colorado right now 
just because of of how hot they've been. Um, you know, if if they can get through Iowa, I like their chances against either Ole Miss or Louisville. Um, I mean, I just I, I think they've really been a team that's that's hit their stride at the right time. You know, so many people picked MTSU to come out of that first round game, and and Colorado put that to bed quickly. Um, and then Duke, I mean, has been the second or third best defensive team in the country pretty much all year. Um, and, you know, they, they get over 60 on them, which is not, not something a ton of teams have done. You know, you saw that UNC game where it was like 45 to 42 or whatever was the final. Um, so yeah, Colorado, Colorado has had a really tough path through the bracket. And I think now they're at the point, you know, with Sanford out of the way where if they get through Iowa, I think that's a, a very legitimate final four team. I mean, I could see it. So my final four as things stand today, because I did have Indiana. Uh, going. I have Stanford. So <laughs> we're one for one there. <laughs> yeah. So I'm still, I'm of the mindset and the belief that South Carolina is on a mission I think they're the only team that can beat South Carolina is if they go like nine for 27 on layups and eight for 21 from the free throw line and Beal and Boston getting foul trouble, that, that could be problematic. Uh, but I've, I've got South Carolina. I'm going with Iowa, LSU, and UConn. Yeah, I was, but, yeah, but I mean, I, UConn is game to game because you don't know yeah. who's going. I mean, one player goes down for them, it's a really big deal. Yeah, and that's why I, I mean, didn't pick them to begin with because that's, you just that's what's tough. Yeah, and, but AZ, I mean, AZ Fudd, I mean, really, she was back against Baylor. That was that was AZ Fudd took over that game. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I feel the same way with Paige. It's so easy to forget how good the two of them are just because we haven't seen them in so long. You know, we've seen so little of them over the last two years. And so when, you know, they're finally out there and they're, you know, they look, they look healthy again. It's, it's almost like seeing it for the first time again, where you're like, oh yeah, this, this is the real deal. Um, so I, I mean, with a hot AZ, I like UConn against pretty much anyone except for South Carolina. Um, and I mean, I think, yeah, Iowa right now is probably the favorite in, in Seattle for, but I, I don't really like anybody who's left there. So I mean, I think any of them could beat each other. Um, and then that, that top bracket. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I had Utah in my final four in my, in my bracket picks originally. Um, but I think either LSU or Utah is is a pretty solid lock for that spot. Um, but yeah, I mean, South Carolina for South Carolina to lose, things would have to go horribly wrong. <laughs> and that's kind of what I've I've been saying. You know, I, I think things would have to go horribly wrong. They're going to have to make mistakes, and it's going to have to be an opponent that is able to capitalize on those. Um, and, and that's why I think UCLA is is maybe the toughest matchup left in the bracket for them because. UCLA has shown in the past that they're able to do that, you know, and they did that with teams in the Pac-12 this year. But yeah, if South Carolina plays even a, a solid game against anyone that's left, I'm not concerned for them. <laughs> so I think ESPN may get the all the dream matchups. Like they could get the rematch of yeah. Tennessee and UConn. Then who wouldn't like, Gino Ariema and Kim Mulkey uh, <laughs> on the sidelines, right in Dallas. The former Baylor coach going <laughs> back to Dallas. Vicious. I mean, I can only imagine the outfit that she would wear for that one. And, She's and just saying her Dallas. I mean, I don't know what she has left in the closet at this rate. <laughs> Oh, trust me. There, there's definitely. <laughs> we've, we've had some good ones the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> as long as she doesn't break out the Cruella Deville, uh, I think we'll be okay. And then, if you get Iowa, South Carolina, 
on the other side. I mean, to me, the, the most interesting matchup would be watching Gino and Kim Mulkey both just going nuts on the sidelines. You could have two water bottles thrown in that game. And then the whole buildup, all you would see is probably Aaliyah Boston crying still and Caitlin Clark standing up, flexing for the shot she hit against Indiana, which now really, quite <laughs> frankly, doesn't mean jack shit in the grand scheme of things. I hate to put it that way, but it wasn't a shot that won the national championship. It was basically a shot against a team that couldn't get out of the second round yeah, at home. I mean, it's just – it's so, like – I think that's almost the thing that's been frustrating with Iowa is that Iowa is so fun to watch. I mean, they are the most fun team to watch in women's basketball right now. I don't think there's an argument about that, but they're, they're just not the best basketball team. Um, And I don't think there's an argument about that either. You know, it's you, you cannot have a bottom 50 defense and win a national championship. You just can't. I mean, and that's, I, I'm a very defensive minded person. I've always valued that. It's why I am the number one cheerleader for Brie Beal in the country. But I just, I, I just don't see it for them. I don't see a way that Iowa, it, it, I don't see a way that Iowa gets through an Ole Miss or a Louisville even, you know, I, I just, they're not, you can't outscore everyone to the championship. I, I just don't, I don't see a path where that's possible. Um, and if they run into South Carolina in the final four, I think it's going to be a rude awakening for, uh, frankly, a lot of people. <laughs> I agree. That's why I can't bet against South Carolina. Look, I'm a homer. I'm a <laughs> grad. You can look behind me and you can see the first national championship team, you can see Dawn Staley and me with the net lace from 2017 at the team hotel. Judy Gaston, by the way, took that picture. Um, but here's the deal. South Carolina's toughness, the rebounding, the size, the versatility, the depth, And the fact that they rebound 50% of their misses, it doesn't matter. And when Gino Ariema says, well, we got to make at least 10 threes to beat South Carolina. Well, when you only can attempt six, you're not making 10. And so that's why the game plan to me, this team is the total package because they score over 80 points a game. They hold you to 50 or less. They hold you to 31% or less. They shoot 47%. And that's an amazing statistic when you consider how many layups they miss. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is South Carolina wins its bad games. And that's the thing I've I've said a lot this year is, I mean, they've they've had games where they've played really poorly. I mean, at Stanford. And, and at Mississippi State, really. I mean, that was one of their worst showings of the year. And Mississippi State hung in that game, gave them, I think, a seven-point game on the road. And, you know, but at Georgia. they don't lose. That's I mean, that's the thing is they don't lose those games even when, you know, nothing is working the way that they want it to. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, that gets harder the deeper you get into the bracket, obviously. But this is also a team that does really well under pressure, you know, went went into a very hostile environment at UConn and, and won there for the first time ever this year. Um, and again, if I'm South Carolina, do I want to see UConn again? Not really. But, uh, you know, do I am I picking UConn to beat them in any scenario right now? No. You know, even if Paige came back tomorrow, I think I'm still picking South Carolina to win that rematch. I mean, it's just. If it's South Carolina or the field, I'm taking South Carolina right now, you know, just based on on the state of them and also the state of, of everything else I've seen. Defense, rebounding, toughness, but also talent. Aaliyah Boston, Zia Cook, the Freshies. <laughs> what was it like when Olivia Thompson hits the three I mean, it had to be an incredible moment at the end of that game. Yeah, it was really cool. It was, I mean, she got in with 
a little over two minutes left, um, which, I, you know, obviously was very intentional. I think it was, you know, that that class is goodbye to colonial life um, and everybody knew it. And I mean, to see, first of all, you know, for Chloe Kitts to assist her on that three was cool. You know, they have gotten really close. You know, Chloe has, I think, sees Olivia very much as sort of a, a big sister figure to her. Um, and so that was cool for her to get the assist. And then, I mean, the the arena roared when <laughs> that shot fell. It was just, it was cool for Olivia. It was cool from the bench just to see them absolutely lose it. It, it was cool to hear Dawn, you know, laugh talking about it afterwards. It just, it was, it was the perfect way for them to to have their sort of farewell to to colonial life. Um, and you know, obviously Greenville's not too far from home, but that that was a pretty a pretty special moment i think for for all of them all right so when are you heading up to greenville and what type of environment are you anticipating yeah i mean based on the way the sec tournament went i am expecting it to be pretty close to a, a south carolina home game <laughs> anytime they're playing um but we'll have lsu up in greenville too i'll be helping out with some of their coverage um, for my my pal Corey Diaz, who uh, works for the Gannett Paper down in Louisiana. Yeah, um, so, who, oh, so who I'll be was with the Greenville News yes. on the beat last North year. South Carolina beat, right? yeah. Yes, um, so I'll be up there with him um, on Friday, helping out with some LSU stuff as well. But uh, they traveled really well for the SEC tournament, so I would expect to see that again. Um, there was a lot of a lot of purple around town. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting just to see how they handle, I mean, just the number of teams that are going to be there because, you know, the SEC tournament was a, a pretty hectic weekend up there. So I, I'm curious to see how they're going to, they're going to manage all of this, but, um, I think it'll be really cool. I mean, it's, it, it was a really cool environment, even just for the SEC tournament to see, you know, there were Tennessee fans at, you know, Arkansas, Ole Miss and games like that, you know, there were. South Carolina fans every game. There were LSU fans every game, just people watching basketball. Um, and that was one of my favorite parts of, of being at that tournament was just seeing people who had no rooting interest, just hanging out at the games and, and watching. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll see more of that, especially with, you know, the, the stakes right now of this, of this stage in the tournament. So yeah, it, it should be a good time. Um, I'll be up there. Like I said, uh, starting Friday, we'll do, We'll have media on Friday um, and then obviously games that night. And then uh, we'll play Saturday, Sunday. We'll get the elite eight game uh, from the other side of the green hill bracket. Um, and then Monday, obviously we'll, we'll close things out and hopefully we'll be on a flight to Dallas Wednesday evening. So that's, that's my, my kind of seven day outlook. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm waiting on Dallas and it's about a three hour ride straight up. I-35, so. That's not too bad. Um, yeah, so it, it should be, it's going to be an interesting sweet 16. I mean. <laughs> there's really not a bad matchup in it. <laughs> yeah. There's, I mean, there's uh, not a bad game. I I agree. And, and I think there will continue to be some upsets. So we'll see. Um, but I'm with you. Uh, and obviously this is a Gamecock podcast, but. Uh, I think Dawn Staley will be two for two uh, cutting down the nets in Dallas. And here's the bad, sad thing, Emily, is if they don't do it, the season is considered a failure. Yeah. And I, I mean, and a, so and a disappointment. Yeah. And it's, you know, you don't, you don't want it to be that, obviously. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's it's the first regular season undefeated in program history still. It's, you know, the longest win streaks in program history. It's the longest home win streak in program history. It's, you know, I mean, just the records and, and everything that have fallen. And it's, not, you know, you don't want that to be erased if, you know, they lose. Because because teams lose in March Madness. I mean, look, look at Purdue. <laughs> I mean, it's not – it's never impossible. Um Again, you know, if you're you're telling me pick South Carolina or the field, I, I'm taking South Carolina every time right now. But I mean, it's it's hard, and I'm sure it's hard for them. You know, just because of what they've accomplished, if they don't add that one more 
one more win on top of everything else, you know, it's, it's hard that that will, that will sort of fall by the wayside. All right. So last question. And, and I was there in 2017 when Morgan William itty bitty hit the shot heard round the world and broke the longest win streak in the country at like 112 or 116 games. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> South Carolina, four wins away from a season of perfection. That would put them in rarefied air as only one of three or four teams, I believe, to repeat with a perfect season. What does how does that add to the legacy of the Freshies and Dawn Staley? Yeah, I, I mean, it's something. I think it's easy just because of of how easy it's looked for them so many times this year, and, and even so many times last year. I think it's easy to forget how difficult it is what they've done and how yes. like deeply, deeply unusual it is. I mean, to even be in the position to win repeat championships. Repeat championships, I think UConn is the only one to do it since, you know, Tot Summit did it back in the early 2000s in, in 07, 08. Uh, so, I mean, in the last decade, it's been it's been one. <laughs> it's just been Gino. Um, and, and before that, before Gino and Pat, who are, you know, arguably the two most iconic coaches in the history of the sport, it, it's... There's one other. It was Southern California in in eighty two and eighty three. Sure, Cheryl kind of Miller. Yeah. yeah, and and that's, I mean, that is an an unreal level of company to be in. You know, at, at the stage in your career where Don Staley is. You know, it's that that ascends you immediately to legend status because the only coaches who have done it are the legends of the sport. And and I mean, even when you look at undefeated seasons, it's very much the same. There's only been believe five programs that have done it 10 or nine teams uh UConn's got six of them yeah. <laughs> um but it's you know it's it's Kim Mulkey who like her or not is a legend of the sport it's Gino it's Pat and and it's Texas back again another one I think from from well back in like the 80s or 90s Louisiana uh, Tech as well yes that's right and which again a Kim Mulkey team Kim Mulkey <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it's, it's just, it's such an unusual accomplishment and, and it's not supposed to look this easy. I, I think that's, and I think too, we've been sort of desensitized to it because UConn did it so much back in that, you know, 20 teens era where it was just, I mean, the Brianna Stewart years, it was just year after year after year. Um, that's not normal. Like that's not a thing that happens. And, and so I think, you know, for this team, again, to have two losses last year, turn around and have none this year is, I mean, just, it's remarkable. It really is whether they win a national championship or not. I mean, that is an accomplishment that very few people in college basketball can say they've ever even come close to. Emily Adams with the last word. Emily, safe travels to Greenville. Uh, best of luck. Hopefully you'll be there until uh, Tuesday morning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unless, unless you're driving back late Monday night, uh, which is not the most fun drive because I've done it uh, growing <laughs> up in the upstate of South Carolina. But uh, enjoy the atmosphere, the tournament. It should be fantastic. And hopefully – Next week, we can preview the Final Four before you head to Dallas. Yeah, absolutely. And, and hopefully, we'll, we'll see you in Texas. In, in a absolutely. Week. <laughs> you bet. All right. Uh, thanks for being with us today, and thanks for all that you do. And uh, hopefully, we will preview the Final Four next week. Sounds good. Thanks, Keith. Always a pleasure. All right. All right, that was Emily Adams from the Greenville News. Always interesting, uh, intriguing, and great stuff. And no, Mindy, I did not realize you were from 
Lamar, but shout out to all my Lamar peeps uh, on the podcast <laughs> as we sign off. Uh, tomorrow will be a big uh, football uh, centered show on Friday. Mike Yuva will join the podcast. No Garnet and Black Town Hall tonight, but we'll be back next week. I'll definitely miss all my guys and gals uh, tonight, but hopefully there'll be a lot more to talk about next Wednesday. Uh, a couple of uh, welcome homes pending uh, out there. And so we'll wait and see for that. So until next week for Gamecock Pod Live and until tomorrow for Gamecock Pod Daily, this has been episode 1183. Thanks to Jamie Bradford, who absolutely killed it, and Emily Adams, who is just so good at her job and is a treat every time we have her on the show. Thank you. And I'll see all my patrons tomorrow. And for everybody else, I'll see you next week on Gamecock Pod Live. Keith Allsep, signing off. I am out of here.